Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. I have the honor of being elected to the Virginia Humanities Board. And as you're listening to this, I should be about an hour away from Roanoke for my first board meeting. But the bigger news is that Another View has been nominated for a Salute to Excellence Award from the National Association of Black Journalists for our live broadcast from the Buffalo Soldiers Convention in Hampton last summer. I'll be back live with you next week. But for now, sit back and enjoy this encore edition of Buffalo Soldiers live from Hampton right after this national, regional, and local news from NPR and WHRO News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View, broadcasting live from the National Association of Buffalo Soldiers and Troopers Motorcycle Club Convention at the Hampton Roads Convention Center here in Hampton, Virginia. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It is so exciting to be back in front of a live studio audience, or not even studio, back in front of a live audience, period, because I have spent far Far too many Thursdays sitting in that studio all by myself talking to my guests on Zoom or on the phone because of COVID. So, and it's really exciting because we are entering today our 12th year on the radio. <laughs> So thank you, listeners, so much for your support. Thank you, all of you who are here in our live audience today. And we really want to hear from you uh, with our questions. But we have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about the Buffalo Soldiers. And we're going to get the history behind Buffalo Soldiers. And then we're going to talk about what it means in modern day times today. So um, what is that history? And what is the Motorcycle Club all about? And how are they connecting the past and the present through their philanthropy. So here to talk about it from a historical perspective is our favorite historian, and she also has a brand new title. She is Endowed Professor of Virginia Black History and Culture at Norfolk State University, Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander. Thank you, Barbara. (laughs) Also joining us um, for perspective on the Buffalo Shoulders of today is Nathan Motown Mack, the national president of NABSTMC. How are you, Nathan? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, thank you so much for being with us. Mr. Ken Dreammaker Thomas. Yes. (laughs) How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. (laughs) And he is the founder of the organization. And Jerome Biggie Smalls, down there on the end, he is president of the Hampton Roads chapter. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate it. All right, I got to start out by, first of all, where do these nicknames come from? And how do you get your nickname? How did you get yours, Motown? Uh, Mine was just because I'm from Detroit. And I love Motown music and love to ride and have a good time. So So did you select it yourself or did the club give it to you? Well, I had a chance to select my own, right? (laughs) Ah, So others are giving their names, right? But doing something they did wrong or something they did right. So (laughs) you never know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. What about you, Biggie? Uh, Pretty much the same thing. You know, my last name is Small, so it's sliding pretty easy. That's what everybody called me anyway. So the the club let me keep it. The trap let me keep it. And since you're the founder, you are the dream maker, sir. Every day. (laughs) <laughs> and he has a great story behind his name. Okay, tell us. Well, short story. Uh, uh, working as a young police officer, my partner and I had a call in the housing projects in Chicago. And we went up to about the 10th floor and we went to an apartment. There were two little kids in there. And we asked where was their mommy and the kids were three or four. So they really couldn't tell us. We waited about 20 minutes, and the young lady came to the door, and, of course, we started in on her, but you could see her eyes were glassy, and she said she had been up on the 17th floor getting ready to jump off the building, commit suicide. So we talked to that young lady. We stayed there probably a good hour and a half, 
told her what she had to live for. Beautiful kid. She was a little heavyweight. We says, hey, that's no problem. She said she didn't have a man. So that's no problem. But uh, she, as things went on, she felt better. And we left and saw her about a year later on another call. And I got out of the car and she said, Officer Thomas, you're my dream maker. Oh. And my partner said, what? <laughs> and she and I said, Oh, yeah. She said, remember me? I'm the young lady that was in the building. I lost weight. I got a man. I'm doing fine. <laughs> right. And she said, you are my dream maker. And, of course, my partner went and told the whole roll call the next day, and the captain called me dream maker. Wow. That is fantastic. And it stayed with me. Wow. Motown, let me ask you this. How many people are here in Hampton, and where, how far away have people come to visit us? Well, we um, are about 1,500 deep today. And uh, we have people as far away as Germany and Honolulu. So most of the riders came in from California. Myself, I rode in about 2,000 miles. So you actually rode your motorcycle? Yes, ma'am. Wow. That's what we do. We, we pound the ground hard to get to where we're going and then make a difference in the community. That is fantastic. Well, we're going to talk to you guys a little bit more about what you're doing in the community and so forth. But I want to turn to you, Cassandra, to talk about the fact that, that Buffalo Soldiers is a... Um, a tradition, it is a part of the, our history, it is a part of the Army. Um, so can you give us some uh, information about how the Buffalo Soldiers got started? Sure, thank you so much. And, and I really want to congratulate all of you for keeping this tradition alive and for showing as you ride the motorcycles what so many of the soldiers who were considered Buffalo soldiers, what they did not only on horseback, but also on foot as infantrymen. So thank you so much. Um, but to answer that particular question, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that after the Civil War, a number of African-American men who were part of United States colored troops were actually sent to Texas and sent to other places in the Midwest, uh, Kansas and so forth, to oversee the protection of the construction of the railroads. Um, America went full, full force into creating a transatlantic uh, railroad system, and they wanted the soldiers, especially those who were part of the United States Colored Troops, to do one of the, the hardest jobs, which is to protect those uh, soldiers in territories that were very dangerous. Um, these were territories that America was taking over. They had laid claim to it, but they were taking over territories that were owned and, and controlled and lived on by native peoples out west and in the Midwest. And so they were constantly besieged with Indian attacks. Um, and, you know, but by 1866, Congress created a, um, uh, six regiments of African-American soldiers. The army, by the way, had segregated itself very early on when African-American men were created or recruited, I should say, to um, come in as soldiers. And we would see this, you know, everyone knows about um, the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, but there were others prior to that time, but they restricted them to all black units. That was not true of the Navy. African American men were segregated to certain positions or restricted to certain positions in the Navy, but, not, but the Army had them completely segregated. They could not have black officers. All the officers were non-commissioned officers who were black. Uh, you did have a few black surgeons who were par assigned to those units, and so they carried those traditions with them, Congress did, when they created um, the six black units. And of course, we would, we would see the 9th and 10th Cavalry that were part of the 24th Regiment. We'd have the 25th. We would have the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st um, uh, Regiments created. And out of that, you would see infantrymen and so forth. And these soldiers would serve during the Indian Wars. A lot of people don't even know that history, that from 1866 to 1867, we fought a war, a concerted effort to destroy 
the native peoples out in the West, to destroy their solidarity as people and to destroy them and their resistance to us taking over their lands. And so the, the men who would later be called the Buffalo Soldiers were sent out West to protect everyone, all the soldiers, and to protect um, the efforts by Americans to settle in those lands. So they were to protect the, um, the farmers, they were pro to protect those cattlemen, they were to protect all of that. And they were put in the line of fire because while they were, were assigned to protect, they were also in the middle of a lot of white hostility and white racism. And often if they were in towns, they were discriminated against um, but, you know, on the plains, they weren't discriminated against because they were often by themselves or they were with a few white units who needed their protection as well. Um, how, they, how black soldiers homogeneously became known as the Buffalo Soldiers has more to do with legend than anything else. Nobody really knows the answer to that. There are a lot of... of um, uh, stories about how the men who were assigned the 10th Cavalry, who was assigned in Kansas, uh, were fighting against the Cheyenne and the Sioux. And there's a lot of discussion about how those soldiers uh, eventually were uh, seen in an honorable way by the native peoples because of how they fought against them, th because they would have battles against the native peoples for sometimes as long as six hours. If you can imagine wow. being in the heat of battle for six hours. Mm. And, and so after a, a, a period of time, by 1867, that's when you would start to see the, the legend emerged, even though those soldiers never referred to themselves as the Buffalo Soldiers, it would not be until really much later, not until about the Spanish-American War, that you would begin to see those soldiers embrace that title and, and make it their own and see this as a badge of honor. So the research that I did, I saw two themes that seem to run through in terms of how they got their name. One was, was as you said, the uh, Native Americans were, were um, saying that their, the way that they fought was so was like a buffalo because mm -hmm. it was strong and it was fierce. And the other was their woolly hair. Mm -hmm. So which, which way do you think it went? <laughs> Any you thoughts? Know, you know, I, I think that um, we have to separate from um, our culture of racism Mm -hmm. um, I do not believe that the Native peoples um, saw hair in that way. You know, I think mm -hmm. that because the buffalo for the Plains Indians was everything, it was their lifeblood. Um, and they saw and they respected the buffalo. Uh, that's why you have people getting killed and hurt today who think that buffaloes are pets and they can go out and pet them. <laughs> they are not pets. You know, you, you, you really wonder what's in the brains of Americans to think that buffalo are some meek, mild, domesticated animal. They are not. And they can be fierce. They are very protective. Um, and they are seen as important to the lifeblood of the community. And I'm of that opinion, that they saw um, African-American men being in the situation that they were in, in a racist environment, and yet they showed honor and they um, did not treat the Native peoples as, as somehow as savages. Uh, they saw them as enemies. And, um, and there's honor between soldiers who see one another not as one being a savage and, and the other being somehow superior, but rather as opponents, as, as, uh, as enemies. And I think that's really, that's the line that I go with. That's mm -hmm. in, in reading some of the accounts of the soldiers who served during that period, that's the, more the impression I get. So... To the dichotomy or the, the irony, I guess, of African Americans fighting Native Americans. And I, I wonder how they dealt with that from a um, mental perspective in terms of, you know, one minority against another and the white man being the enemy of both. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in that sense. Um, how, how do you think that they reconciled their, um, their charge 
by the army to do that? I think for some it was very difficult. Um, and, and, you know, we also have to add this. There were a number of Native Americans who intermingled with African Americans. And that had been going on for a century or more. Uh, actually, for much longer than a century or more prior to that time. So Native peoples, there was not that clear line of division all the time. You think of Nat Love, who, you know, was known as Deadwood Dick. You know, he was part Cherokee and part black. Um, the founder of Chicago was, you know, part black and part Native. And so, you know, that, that tradition goes back quite a distance. I think that the uh, men who were referred to as the Buffalo Soldiers um, were about showing that they were protecting the American government uh, and the American nation. They identified as Americans. And as a result, they were good soldiers. They were going to fight to protect the interests of America. The dichotomy is that America did not see them in that way. They did not honor them as full citizens, even though you had the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, they did not honor them as, as um, in the same way as white soldiers. They paid them a lot less than they paid white soldiers. They did not honor them in the, in the, the uh, accoutrements that they gave them, in the supplies and, and in the support. They were not honored in that way. But these men were not fighting to get all of that from the nation, they were fighting for their future, for the future uh, generations, so that looking back, no one could say they were cowards, that they did not step up to the plate, that they were not willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice to protect and serve this nation. Were there any female Buffalo soldiers? There was one female Buffalo soldier that we know of, and I'm gonna put that caveat. And the only reason we know about her is because she decided she was tired and didn't want to serve anymore. And when she was, um, she was had some health issues. And when she was complaining, and the the doctor uh, took care of her, that's when it was revealed she was a female. So if you can imagine this woman, and I her name is escaping Kathy me right Williams. now. Kathy Williams. Kathy Williams. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when she was. Um, you know, you think this young woman, how in the world could these men not know that this young woman was a woman? <laughs> well, I think that they, some of them probably knew, but she was fighting. And this isn't the first time that a woman, whether uh, the woman was white or African-American, had served in the forces. And she was, she was known as a, a tall, uh, you know, very muscular type of woman, and she probably was scary in terms of what she was capable of doing. Um, and, and uh, you know, and I'm reminded of the traditional of the women of Dahomey, who were the primary um, uh, warriors in that particular kingdom. Um, when you would hear the drum beats of the women of the, the fighters, the soldiers of Dahomey, men fled because they knew that when you sent the women in, if you sent, sent them in to kill, everybody was killed. If you <laughs> sent them in to take control, that's what happened. And and that tradition continues to in this that day. area to Let this women, day. Women power, absolutely. Yes. So knowing that rich history um, and, and what it all, it all entails, I'm gonna ask um, Ken, Dream Maker, you started the Motorcycle Club. Yes. Why? Well, uh, you got to remember, I was a law enforcement officer in Chicago at that time. And many of the clubs uh, within Chicago, they would have the various parties and events. And those events weren't, shall we say, uh, uh, they're not the type of events I wanted to take my wife or children to. And uh, I wanted, uh, I know I couldn't be around anything that was illicit mm -hmm. or, or, or just wasn't up to Illegal. par. And I knew that there were uh, primarily a lot of writers out here, individuals who wanted to be able to go to, uh, who had the passion of riding motorcycles, but wanted to go to uh, get together, be able to take their uh, significant others with them mm -hmm. and be able to take their children if it was uh, that type of event and enjoy themselves. And being in law enforcement, you, you just couldn't be around um, 
some lawlessness. So what year was it when you started and, and how did you pull it together? Uh, actually, uh, I use, we used 1993, but I actually started the club in, in 1989. Mm -hmm. And I was still on the job working and uh, mm -hmm. pulled it together because, like I said, there was a need for individuals who wanted to be in a, uh, to do something, give back to our community, to wanted to do something that was respectful to African Americans. We, we wanted to get out there and say that we're, uh, we love motorcycling, we are uh, African American club. And we wanted to keep this history and traditional line with the Buffalo Soldiers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the main thing was also showing our community that we're in the community and we're not negative. We're positive. We're giving back. Well, Motown, let me ask you this. When people see you all riding together, you know, some may characterize you as a gang. Is that right? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so people who don't know who we are would do that. But we're known across the country as we call it doing good in the hood. Mm -hmm. And so we are out there pounding the ground trying to make a difference. So people actually open up to us. We, we spread the history about what we do. And like the Buffalo Soldiers of yesterday, we still ride horses. Our horses just happen to be iron horses. And uh, it's actually a, uh, what you call, icebreaker. So when we go into different communities, the children love to see, you know, the motorcycles as well as the adults. So we have a great time when we're out there, as we did yesterday. So do you, how do you become a member do you have to be in law enforcement or do you or have served in the uh, military or we have uh, people from everywhere, active duty, military, retired military, doctors, lawyers, business owners. We have some everything. But the focus is one being able to ride. We ride first. Mm -hmm. Right. We educate on the history of the Buffalo soldiers and we do good in the hood. And we just want to preach that because that's who we are as a people. We go in and we want to make a difference no matter where we are. So Biggie, you are the president of the local chapter. Yes, um, how many members and what are some of the things that you guys have done in the Hampton Roads area uh, specifically? Have, yes, ma'am. We have 31 uh, active members uh, along with some retirees, but in, the uh, in our neighborhood, ma'am, what we usually do is uh, the food banks, uh, give back to the women's shelters, uh, some of the churches we've been involved in as well, as well as the detention centers as well. So we mm -hmm. kind of do that, ma'am. That's what we got to give it to the community. And of course, just preach what dream uh, set forth all those years ago. Mm -hmm. So as motorcycle riders, and, and, and any of you can answer this question, what would you want others on the road <laughs> to know as you're coming, as you're riding? Because that can be pretty intimidating when you see groups of motorcycles together. And, and you're riding along. Um, you're worried about safety, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and so is the motorist. So what would you want to say to motorists uh, when they see a group of you? Give us a little space. <laughs> 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 Give us a little space so we don't have to create space. But, you know, I would tell you, uh, first of all, we're the best looking club <laughs> on the planet. That's right. right. So as we're riding down the highway, a lot of people want to take pictures and all that. And it creates an a issue sometimes, right? So with that being said, um, just give us a little space and, uh, so we can get down the highway, get to our destination so that our families know that we're okay. Okay. And do you teach people how to ride? Oh, we have a, we have a Go ahead. course going on right now. Uh, we oh. have safety courses, a uh, road captain course. And so we have people, I went to it um, yesterday or two days ago. Mm -hmm. And so we teach them to be better riders and so they can take away, you know, good tips, right, and go back to their chapters and be able to teach those basic riding skills to the in, each individual. Okay. What I, Now, I read that the requirement is that you have to ride 750cc. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and what kind, of, what kind of bike is that? Well, well first of all, that? 750 is a small bike. But, oh, we, okay. but we allow you to come in. But after you ride with us for about a week, you, you'll get a bigger bike. Right? <laughs> Because you'll get tired of being left on the heels, right? <laughs> so, but uh, we, I mean, it's just the size of the bike, the engine. And so we okay. just get out there and buy us riding long distance. You know, you need a, a bike that's more comfortable. Okay. So let me ask you, um, what is it like when you're riding? Can you describe that feeling? Well, most people, most motor, motorcyclists feel like it's a uh, feeling of freedom. When you're on the open road and, the, and you're, you're out in the wind and weather, even the rain elements, you're out there, it's you, the elements, and if you're with your brothers and sisters, 
that is one of the most beautiful feelings. Mm -hmm. Just to be out, whether you're on twos or threes. When, when I say, of course, threes, uh, trikes, uh, mm -hmm. the three-wheelers now. But it's uh, bonding. It, it gives you time to bond. It uh, gives you time to think. And, of course, as Motown said, uh, you're sharpening your skills out there. And uh, it's, it's a passion that goes from uh, women, kids, men. I mean, you just name it. People who happen to ride. Love tend to love motorcycling. Mm -hmm. What got you into motorcycling in the first place, Motown? Oh, uh, when I was a kid, I used to see all the the old adults. I called them old adults, you know. <laughs> I was about ten years old, and you would see them on these motorcycles, right? Mm -hmm. And they would look like they was having a good time. So at sixteen, I kind of picked it up. But uh, it's exciting. It's like Dream just said, being out there on the road uh, with your brothers and sisters, it's it's nothing like it. The other night we rode almost twelve straight hours in the rain, right? Our uh, road captain, I'll leave him nameless, uh, road runner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he dragged us for 12 hours uh, in the rain. And, and I will tell you, I was never so proud of a group of people who hung in there and rode through all of that. And, and at the end of it, I mean, it's just a proud moment to see that because it builds self-confidence within us. I was going to say, isn't that dangerous, though? I no, mean, is it the pouring down rain you're talking about? I'm pouring down rain. <laughs> so we were wet for almost 18 total hours. So, wow. but that's why you have good tires. We have safety things in place where we uh, check people's tires and, you know, the basic T clocks type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these bikes are just like cars. You know, you ride your car in the rain, you ride your bike in the rain. Oh, my goodness. If you're just joining us, we're broadcasting in front of a live audience at the National Association of Buffalo Soldiers and Troopers Motorcycle Club Convention at the Hampton Roads Convention Center. My guests are historian and endowed professor of Virginia Black History and Culture at Norfolk State University, Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander, uh, Nathan Motown Mack, the national president of NABS-TMC, Mr. Ken Dreammaker Thomas, who is a founder of the organization, and Jerome Biggie Smalls, who is president of the Hampton Roads chapter of the Buffalo Soldiers and Troopers Motorcycle Club. Do we have any questions from our audience? Do you guys have any questions that you would like to ask our guests? Normally, this is the time when I would be throwing out a phone number. <laughs> for people to call in. But if you're listening to us on the radio, please sit back and enjoy, and we're going to hear some questions from our studio audience. Uh, yes, there's a question in the back there. Let's see. Hi, how are you? Hello. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations, Dr. Cassandra Alexander Newby, or Newby Alexander, <laughs> on your recently endowed professorship. Thank you. I am delighted to be among you all. And... Um, I have two questions, actually. First is, who has written the, there's so much material out there on the Buffalo Soldier. I would like to know who's written an authoritative, uh, authoritative, definitive history of the Buffalo Soldiers that you could recommend. That's my first question. Okay. Cassandra, you want to answer that? You know, I'm going to <clears throat> start with Benjamin Quarles, who's actually written um, <clears throat> a number of books on the soldiers during the American Revolution, the Civil War, and he's talked about the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, there are a few others out there that um, I, I, would, I would not necessarily recommend. Um, I would start with him. Um, I know that some of the, there are some firsthand accounts of soldiers that were collected by Joseph T. Wilson in his book, The Black Phalanx. He was a person who was actually born in Portsmouth, Virginia, and he joined the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, he's actually buried at, um, uh, at, the, at, Hampton, at Hampton University, the, the national uh, burial ground for soldiers there. Um, and he's someone who actually collected uh, firsthand accounts of soldiers during the Civil War as well as afterwards. So some of those accounts were from Buffalo soldiers, what we call Buffalo soldiers. And so I, I always say, look at what the people had to say about their own lives. And then look at what historians have said and how they've interpreted it. And I also um, suggest that people look at John Hope Franklin's book that's been written 
numerous times, um, but Evelyn Higginbotham recently came out with a new revised book that looks at the Buffalo Soldier. So it gives you a history, but it incorporates it into the larger history of um, African Americans and the American nation. So that's also a good book to look at. And you had another question? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Cassandra. Thank you. Yes. I took notes. <laughs> the second, I was on vacation in Alaska years ago, and we were in the Klondike region, and we went to a certain museum. And I'll never forget the lady, when she found out, Cassandra, we were from the Hampton Roads chapter of the association started by Carter G. Woodson, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the Hampton Roads chapter. She wanted to know more about the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, dealing with the Klondike situation. It seems as though they were trying to maintain order in that area, and she wanted to know more about the Buffalo Soldiers' uh, involvement in maintaining order among, I guess, that a lot of guys had made a lot of money with the gold, and they were getting, un you know, rowdy, you know, celebrating, and the Buffalo Soldiers were called in that area to maintain order. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, the, the, the men were sent all over the world, to, to maintain order. I'm thinking about the 24th who were sent down um, to Cuba um, during the Spanish-American War. Um, and even prior, excuse me, afterwards they were sent, um, you know, Charles Young, Colonel Charles Young was in charge in, in 1903. They were sent out to, uh, what is it, um, uh, the Sequoia, to help to create the Sequoia Forest, not forest, but the park. Mm -hmm. um, and so African-American soldiers were sent to protect, sometimes to build roads, um, to um, bring back order to an area. Uh, I find it interesting because while they were sent to do that and protect that, um, once order was established, then they were pushed out um, and restricted to um, a, a fort or barracks that was located outside of that region. And so it's, you know, America's had a very complicated view and tradition and approach to how they dealt with uh, the Buffalo Soldiers. They wanted them to establish important things, but then at the same time, they became a liability because of racism. Cassandra, didn't the Buffalo Soldiers also become park rangers? Um, at some point, well, or, or that, help with the building of right, the national what, park? Right, that's what I'm okay. talking about. You okay. know, the Sequoia uh, okay. Forest was one of those areas that they helped to establish. And, you know, they were building the roads in that particular forest. And a lot of, a lot of just like with the botanical gardens here in Norfolk, with the, especially the black women who created that, it took and is taking too many years to mm -hmm. recognize and to honor the work of these individuals in helping to create these important parks. Other questions from the audience? Yes, there's one right here. Thank you. I was wondering if there was a story, significance, or symbolism with the colors that you're wearing with the black Okay, the colors are gold and black. Is that, am I right uh, with that? Original colors are navy and, oh. and gold. So uh, basically, I don't see. Where's the navy? Well, we, on the on the on the colors. Ah, there on it the is. Back, okay, right? I see it. Okay. So that's how we use it. But a lot of people use, you know, the darker colors, uh, and then we use the gold shirts, of course, so it's easier to see us and identify who we are. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you compare to other clubs, other motorcycle clubs? Huh. Well, <laughs> in the words of my founder here, which I call him Pops, right? <laughs> We uh, may not be the best, but we the best we know. <laughs> so that's how we compare. <laughs> so we we this is a great bunch of people, a great bunch of individuals who love to do what we do, and so we are all proud of what we do, right? So, you know, we compare ourselves to no one. We just do what we do. Mm -hmm. Dreammaker, when I saw a lot, I see a lot of women here. Yes. And um, I assume that they ride. When you first started the club, were there a lot of women in the club? Actually, uh, the individuals I recruited did not want women to be a part of the club. Oh. And I told them, I said, no, my wife is going to be a part of this club. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, it followed suit uh, since I was the boss <laughs> that the other members brought in their wives or significant others. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you now, that was probably the best thing 
ever happen to us. Why? Because we as men, uh, I was 39 years old and, and little rambunctious and the guys were rambunctious and <laughs> we uh, traditionally motorcycle clubs party. That's what they did. <laughs> That's all they did was party. But I wanted more. And I knew that the women, if you brought your wife or your significant other around, you were going to conduct yourself a certain way. And you had to respect our women. And that was uh, in our original bylaws, respecting your uh, women, your mates. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to have no cursing around here. And, you know, none of this crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And the image that I wanted to project to people was that we're a positive group. And, and we, like I said, we made a difference. And I didn't want people to see us mm -hmm. negatively. Where is the furthest each of you has ever ridden? Let me start with you, Dreammaker. Probably about five blocks from now. No. <laughs> uh, I, I think actually Hampton Roads uh, in 2013 we were here. But these guys, are, when, when I say these are some riders and our women too, these guys are riders. He can better answer Both that. Uh, so, for me, a 6,700-mile trip. So, wow. going from where I live in El Paso to the East Coast, go up the coast, come back to the West Coast, and then you riding around trying to see the sights and then come back home. So, we have a lot of riders that do that. We have a lot of riders here today uh, that came from California. Yeah. So, that's a 3,000-mile one-way. Uh, the crew, wow. um, he's not here, but my national essay, he rides seven hours to pick me up. And then we start a ride. So especially if we come in east. So we have a lot of women, and I'm proud of them right. all the time, that get on those iron horses, and they go down that highway just like we do. And I ain't going to lie, some of them ride better than we do. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that is correct. So, yeah. Do we have any women in the audience that, that are, are riders? Yeah. Do you, you guys want to say something? Lisa, grab one of them so we can talk to them about what it's like to ride. <laughs> well, I'll What's tell the, you right now, I love it. And you ask how big of a bike, if yes. you turn around and see that bike sitting right behind you, uh oh, outside, yes. that's mine. That's 1,700 cc's. Okay. <laughs> and I rode down, I rode down to Jacksonville, Florida, Mobile, Alabama. I'm, I'm heading west. I think next year I'm going to hit the west coast. Where are you from? With my camera. I'm from New Jersey. From New Jersey. So how long did it take you to get here? Uh, it took five hours because we... They, you ride with me, you're going to have to stop so I can take pictures. So it took us five hours. <laughs> I've been taking pictures of all the different love signs in Virginia. Oh, wow. Oh, that, that's neat. It's, it's awesome. It's that's awesome. Neat. It's great. That is fantastic. So I know that you guys did something in the community um, because you give back to each community wherever you have your convention. Um, so who wants to talk about that? Biggie? Uh, yes, well, the national, pre the national president went to uh, some of the housing areas we had here, uh, gave back some... Uh, some meals along with some uh, school supplies for coming school year. Oh, that's so that's something great. we did uh, on Tuesday, and we'll do it again today. And then t also today, we'll try to get out to the, to the uh, detention center as well. And talk to so many younger kids at risk. There were just a few things we did while we were here this week. Mm -hmm. Why is that important to you, Motel? Uh, giving back is always important. Paying it forward. Um, for one, one thing that hits me, I grew up poor. And uh, everybody needs to help sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and if we can go in and help others have a better life, even if it's just for a day, for a moment. You know, just showing people that you care can change someone's life. We met a young man yesterday in the uh, apartment complex where we went, um, spent 18 years in prison here. And uh, before he went to prison, he was homeless, sleeping at the bus station. Mm. And so he changed his life around and now he gives back in that same apartment complex that we went to, changing the lives of those youngsters, letting them know that they can do things better. And so, Affecting people like that to be involved because you got to start with your own community, mm -hmm. right? Be involved in your community to make a difference. And you know, we always say, if I can change the life of one, then I'm successful, yeah. right? But with these group of people of men and women that we have, they change people's lives daily. Reach out because you never know. You can just say, hey, how you doing? And change someone's life to show somebody that you care. So that's what we're about. You know, we just make that difference. And we're going to continue to do that because that's what we do. Right. How much does it cost to join? Two dollars. Two dollars. Two dollars. Two dollars. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah, so, so it's really not. I won't say it's a cost. It's a, the cost is your time. Your okay. Your cost is the will to give back. 
right? It's not necessarily financial. It's mm-hmm. it's one of those things that you want to come in and again make a difference. And you know, on one accord. And what brings us together are those iron horses that we use to get to where we're going. Do you guys compete in terms of who has the best bike? We do. And, and if you come out on Friday, <laughs> right, we're going to have a sound competition and we're going to have the who has the prettiest bike and we're going to have all that stuff going okay, on. Okay, what time? Tell us a little bit about that so we can um, tell our audience to come on out. To, I think it's from 10 to 2. Matter of fact, so the escort that we had yesterday, some of the law enforcement guys, they are into the sound competition. So they're going to stop by with their bikes, personal bikes, right? <laughs> And they're going to join in into the sound competition. So we're going to have a good time doing it. <laughs> that is fantastic. Another, another uh, question from our audience. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is um, Beowulf Raleigh Chapter. My question is for uh, Dreammaker. Dreammaker, um, I know we, uh, you stated that we are an African-American uh, motorcycle club. And what happens when people from different cultures come into our organization? They have... Uh, Beliefs that are contrary to our beliefs, like they um, they might. Well, this came up. They didn't want us to pray in the um, you know in our meeting. We have chaplains, and they didn't want us to pray. So how do how do we handle stuff like that? Dreammaker, you got to remember our our group is uh, very diverse, and when you talk about religion, uh, it covers a wide spectrum. Yes, we do have Christians and Muslims and. You name it. Uh, that I do re- recall an uh, individual who could not, he felt he couldn't stay within the meeting when we would pray. Well, that's up to him. Uh, if you're from a different culture, what we want you to do as a Buffalo soldier or trooper is to read about our history and, and adhere to our bylaws, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to give back as far as the wide spectrum. And uh, as you know, we don't discriminate. Uh, as far as race. Mm-hmm. If you're about this Buffalo Soldier uh, history and writing and, 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 and educating and giving back, then we welcome you. You know, if you, you hung up on uh, your religion that you can't mix in, might not be the best club for you. Mm. Another question from the audience, Lisa? All right, this question is for Dream. I've been a member of this organization for 16 years. What were your thoughts when you started this organization? And uh, what are your thoughts now that you see that you created a, a family? Now, it's not an organization, this is a family. We support each other all over the country. And, and I just wonder, what's your vision for us moving forward? Well, ah. I want the club to continue to grow. Uh, as Motown said, you know, I stated years ago that we want to ride, we want to educate, we want to give back. That covers quite a bit. And as far as... Um, you know, as I stated, I, I want the club to continue to grow, continue to do things. We're changing people's uh, perception about motorcycle clubs and have been doing that for 28 years. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay. Another question from our audience? Yes, I have a question. Um, on your jackets and in your literature, I see a gentleman. Uh, who is that gentleman? This on guy. It is I. That on, is, on, on your jacket. Right here. That's you. That's me. Oh, <laughs> it is <okay>. I. <laughs> Wonderful. And for the historian, uh, you said that the regiments, of course, were all black. But on TV, a lot of times, we see that the commanding officers were white. Was that the situation then, or were they totally black from top to bottom? They were not totally bla- black from top to bottom. Um, the... The way that America segregated the military is that even when there was an all-black unit, there would always be all-white commanders. Um, The nation would not recognize an officer who was black unless that person was a non-commissioned officer or if they were a surgeon, which means they would not command troops. It really wouldn't be until Charles Young became head Uh, in 1903 that he then was the first black commander of what we see as the Buffalo Soldiers. Okay, another question from our audience. Hi, my name is Valerie Jones Williams. I'm actually part of the Tidewater chapter of Tuskegee Airmen, another Uh uh, organization. Uh, I saw the scholarships in your program. Could you tell us a little bit more about the scholarships that have been awarded? Fantastic. Uh, Yes, ma'am. 
So we venture out. Every chapter has a, or has a scholarship program as well as our frontier, as we call them, which are some people will say regions. But overall this year, the national organization is awarding over $60,000 worth of scholarships to individuals. Mm. Uh, our overall winner this year came from Meridian, Mississippi. A uh, young lady, very smart. Her grandmother got her when she was very young. And when I tell you, really mannerable, personable, loving, and I'm saying that about the grandma, right? <laughs> but, but her granddaughter, who, the winner, was just as good. But her grandmother instilled in her the importance of education and giving back. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to uh, assist her in her endeavors of moving forward. And we're going to continue to do that. So last year, we gave out $60,000. This year, we gave out 60000 And my goal for the organization next year is 100000 And that, and that in itself, uh, that's just from the national organization as a whole. But each individual chapter, they do the same thing. You know, their scholarship, uh, the financial assistance that they give may not be as much, but it's something to help that individual, to that, that young high school graduate that's getting ready to go into college. Mm -hmm. Do you have chapters in every uh, state? We have 38 states. 38 states. Yes. So far. So I want each of you to think of a story. Something weird, wonderful, or crazy <laughs> uh -uh. that has happened to you on a trip that you can share. <laughs> Let me put that caveat there <laughs> that you can share. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. It's so, start, let me start with Biggie. Ooh. Wow, <laughs> Do okay. you have a story? <laughs> I don't really have a story, but uh, trips is about memories. Uh, and the biggest thing that happens on a trip really are breakdowns because uh, everybody gets laughed at. Um, <laughs> uh, when that happens, uh, or somebody forgets something. Uh, of course, then the most, most uh, horrible thing is the accident. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the thing that carried, that stays with that club, you know, for the duration of that club or chapter. Um, so that was probably the biggest things for me that I've seen, and unfortunately, I've seen both mm -hmm. uh, in my time uh, as a member here. And if somebody has an accident, I mean, I guess everybody is involved, even if if not all the bikes are involved. Abs is that yeah, absolutely. We don't leave anybody on the side of the road. If you see a bike, somebody's going to stay until it's it's cleared. Uh, we want you'll never see a biker from, with this with this with this. Uh, these colors on, mm -hmm. on a road by himself if he's, if he's riding in a pack or she's riding in a pack. We okay. will stay with them until they're squared away. Okay. So All right. What even if you? a bike break, I guess for me, it's the camaraderie. So just something the other night, uh, we had someone, you know, lose a phone and we had been riding in the rain all night and everybody hung in together. Nobody was complaining like, let's go, let's go mm -hmm. because we are a family. We're going to stick together. And basically, we're going to go when everybody's ready to go. And so that's important. But we're, there are stories. And if you look at some of these names, <laughs> they got their names for doing something, right? Oh, so, so the club can name you for something that you may do that. And change your name. So like my name, fortunately, you know, is Motown. However, I've never had a drink in my life, right? So mm -hmm. my chapter wanted to change my name to Kool-Aid. So, because <laughs> I, I, I was substandard in the drinking area, right? But, uh, but, I mean, we have a lot of different names, a lot of reasons those people got the names and. And, it, and it's fun, right? It's fun. So I, I promise you, you, you might have one before we leave here. So Uh-oh. You know. <laughs> uh -oh. So keep up the good work. That's all I can tell you. A story? For me, it's the people. It's each and every one of you out there. It's our club members. I have met people throughout this country, from other countries. Uh, I don't know if Motown mentioned it, but we're uh, actually bringing in uh, our Germany chapter. I saw people walking around with Germany on the back of their uh, vests. They have been uh, on probation for a year. Yes, sir. And oh, they will wow. be officially brought in as a chapter uh, during our meeting. Oh, can so congratulations to them. Yeah, it, it is a family. It's the people. And, and uh, I tell you, I'm thrilled. Every time I, I go somewhere throughout the country, I'm, I'm welcome. And uh, what gets me is that 75% of our members don't know my real name, but they know Dreammaker. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. <laughs> but I love the people. And you, and you love the people. So if someone wants to start riding, um, no matter what age, what, would your, what do you suggest they do? Take a riding course. Um, your local Harley-Davidson dealer offers, offers courses. Some of the community colleges mm -hmm. offer courses. And... And really, uh, I'll tell you a story, like the Michigan chapter at one point, uh, one of the husbands got sick and the wife was on the back and she couldn't get the bike back home because, you know, he couldn't ride. So they're kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. So back then they had Leatherneck. Leatherneck told everybody, OK, all the women that are ride on the back of the bikes, all you guys are going to class. You're going to learn how to ride. 
something happens to your significant other, uh -huh. you'll be able to bring that bike back. So they all go to class, but then they all come back and buy their own motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't work out as well as he thought, right? <laughs> So, yeah. so hey, it's all about fun and riding. So, is purchasing a bike a, a personal thing? I mean, is it like you know, like a personal selection of a car? So, different people like different things. What do you look for when you when you're trying to decide what kind of bike you want to ride? Comfort. That's the biggest piece. Um, you know, a lot of us are like Biggie's bike. You know, he's got to have that loud Harley, right? <laughs> you know, and and he's got to look good with the big bars. Oh, you do this thing up here with the hold, holding the handlebars so, so, way up something top? Something like that. Something like something that. Like that. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. You know, I, you know me, I'm personally, I have both. I have the, the Harley Davidson. I have the F6B. Mm -hmm. uh, anything less than 12 hours, probably ride a Harley. But over that, I'm looking for pure comfort. So I'm probably on my gold wing going across country, which is what I rode out here. Wow. They're what mentioning mm -hmm. they're mentioning these names of bikes. I don't know if you're familiar with those bikes. But really the premier bike <laughs> in in America is the one that they discontinued victory. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hey, see this creates <laughs> hey so uh -oh. this is where it creates <laughs> the point of contention, right? <laughs> So, but you know, most of the bikes uh, are personal choices, right? They're, yeah. they're personal choices, and it's what makes you feel good that day, right? That's right. what you want to get on. So, we just welcome like, again anything over seven fifty, but eventually you're going to have a big bike. <laughs> but this victory thing, you know, yeah. is a reason why they went out of business. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, you can feel the camaraderie and, right. and feel the love um, of you guys. Where's your convention next year? Tampa, Florida. So everybody from this area and, and further north and further south, everybody's going south. Everybody's going south. We're going to have a great time. We're already planning. We got the people here from Tampa on ground already. Mm -hmm. And we're looking forward to having a great time. Just like here last night, everybody had a great time outside. And you know, the biggest thing is a lot of us, this is when we get this chance to see each other. And it's been a year. And so it's like a homecoming, right? So we all come and Did fellowship. you guys get, you didn't ride during the pandemic, did you? Oh, yeah. Did you really? Oh, yeah. Oh, Everybody, wow. you gotta Everybody. Get, oil got to go through the engine. <laughs> <laughs> so. all, all the germs went through the engine. <laughs> so, so you did ride then. Yes, you have one minute left. Okay, I, do, I understand we have the oldest member of uh, the club in the audience, do the, we? Yes, we do. Uh, and and he's, he's my personal confidant right there. That young man is 80 plus years old. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm not just the oldest male. It's my wife. She's right behind me. Right. 77. <laughs> All right. Oh, my. Listening audience, if you could see them, and you thanks would not for believe us. that. We have a great time here, and we love doing what we do. Oh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Very thank much. you. We do truly appreciate that. So, <laughs> well, guess what? We're out of time. Can you believe it? <laughs> Thank you all so much for allowing us to be here with you all here and, uh, at the convention and to be able to tell the story of the Buffalo Soldiers. We wish you guys the very, very best. And, uh, and we really appreciate that. And special thanks to the Hampton Roads Convention Center for hosting us today. Uh, and we also want to tell you that if you missed part of today's show or want to share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. Next week on Another View, it's the Another View Roundtable with civil debate about today's current events. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn and Victor Bowen are our audio engineers. And Dr. Barry Graham monitored things back in the studio. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. For those of you visiting, welcome to Hampton Roads. And since we stream our show live every Thursday at at noon at anotherviewradio.org. We hope you will join our listening audience for Another View. Thanks for listening, everyone.
Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org.